Now, a plural is a real good uh, illustration of the church for several reasons. Number one, the plural is, is created through suffering. A grain of sand or something will get in that oyster shell, and it causes an irritation. Not only that, the pearl is formed by accretion. That means daily that oyster secretes some kind of a fluid that coats that grain of sand, and it adds to that daily, and that pearl grows day by day, but it's still one pearl. We know that we are all baptized into the body of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, that yet we're one church. All believers make up that pearl of great Christ. Now, the Bible says this. It says that he gave all that he had. Now, what does that entail? Well, I don't know, and you probably don't know, and I don't know if anybody really knows what all that entails when we stop to think that Christ gave all that he had. Now, we know that Christ was with the Father in the beginning. But we know that he was willing to lay aside of that glory to come to planet Earth. Now, we don't realize or can't realize just what that entails, to give even that. We know that Paul said, I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, he says, I don't know, I can't tell. Of course, he was speaking of himself. And he said he was caught up into the third heavens and heard things unlawful to utter. So if we can't even describe what he heard, can you imagine the glory that Christ had with the Father from the beginning that had his eye on a pearl and was willing to lay aside that glory and come to planet Earth in order to purchase that pearl of great pride? I don't know what all it meant when he said he gave up all that he had. We know that he gave his life blood on the old rugged cross, and we know that he was willing to be separated from the Father. Now, that, that might not mean a lot to you, but stop and consider he had never been separated from the Father since the beginning of eternity and never will again to the end of eternity. Now, many men have died the horrible day after the cross. Many Christians have been crucified. Many of them have been nailed to an old rugged cross. But no man suffered like this man. Now, here's the reason. Have you ever done anything that you felt deep shame for? Have any of you ever felt deep guilt for something? Well, keep in mind that all of the shame of the world, all of the guilt of the world, all of the sins of the world was laid suddenly on someone that didn't know what sin was, that had never had a guilty conscience, that had never at one time experienced sin or regret in his life. Suddenly, the sin of the whole world was laid on his shoulders. The moment that happened, God turned his back on him. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Because he gave all that he had to purchase that pearl of great Christ. If you say you need to thank God that you're part of that pearl that Christ bought and paid for. Now, it just makes sense to me, and, I, and I'm, I'm certainly hoping it will make sense to you, that if Christ paid is such a tremendous price for something that he prized to that extent, then it just makes sense that he's going to guard it. Does that just make sense? You know, uh, Fort Knox, I don't know a lot about Fort Knox, but I know one thing, Fort Knox, no doubt, has every electronic surveillance device that you can imagine to guard that gold, that treasure that they have buried several stories underground. There's no telling how many huge steel vault doors that you've got to get to through just to see that gold. There's no telling how many armed guards that you've got to pass in order to get to that gold. And you know what the Bible says there? 
that just one thing is far more valuable to God than all the gold in sport and night. So what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So we know that God deems one soul worth it more than all the treasure that this world contains. So can you imagine now the elaborate security system that God has set up to guard that pearl of great price? I guarantee he has got a security system that will never fail. Now, this morning, this sermon is going to be more judicial than it is experiential. I'm going to finish with a little bit of experiential point. The primary is judicial. What does God do when he saves an individual? Now, we give an invitation, and a little child will come up and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Or an adult will come up and say, Jesus, uh, come up and say, Jerry, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, and I ask him to forgive me for my sins. And so we will welcome him into the fellowship, and we baptize him, and we praise God. But we have no idea, or don't think a lot of times, of what goes on behind the scenes. Now, when they come up trusting Jesus, that's one thing. But I want to take you uh, behind the scenes and tell you and show you what goes on at that very moment. The first thing that happens to a sinner, a convicted sinner that surrenders to Christ, that trusts Christ, they are immediately taken to the judgment bar of God. That's the first thing that happens. Now, I want to show you something. When I say this is judicial, and it's non-experiential. Now, when you're justified, and you don't feel that. When you're sanctified, you don't feel that. When a little child comes up and sh- accepts Jesus as their Savior, there's a lot of things going on in the world they're not even aware of at that moment. The first thing that happens is they are, they are have a trial. They are brought before the judgment. I'm talking about positionally. The judgment bar of God. Well, how many here has ever bought a house? Or sold a house? I sold a house here not too long ago to Robin and Dan. And they have what's called an abstract. Do you all know what an abstract is? They vary in thickness, and what the abstract does is tell everybody that ever owned that piece of property. I mean, it goes way back. Just way back to the Indians or whatever was here before then. And every time that uh, anyone borrows money on that place, a new page or two is put in that abstract. And so uh, some abstracts will be pretty thick if the property is changed hands several times. Now, if you sell a house, now I'll sell Robin da- Danny a house. Now, a lawyer, I didn't even understand all this stuff years ago, but a lawyer must bring that abstract up to date. Now, what they do on a attorney examines that abstract page by page and they go to the courthouse to see if that abstract has any rings or judgment against it. For instance, if I own a home and I don't pay the taxes, when I start to sell that home, that attorney will turn that up and say, whoa, there's taxes owed on this property. Those taxes must be paid before I can sell the property. There's what's called labor lien. If a person works and improves someone's house, that person doesn't pay them, they can slap a labor lien on them. And that is on record at the courthouse. Therefore, if I try to sell my house, the attorney said in the abstract says, wait a minute, Mr. Dobbs, there's a lien, there's a judgment against this property in the form of a labor lien. You've got to pay that man before this is cleared. Or maybe you've been sued and you didn't pay it. That's called a judgment. You don't get out of anything. You don't have to pay it, but when you sell that house, it'll come up on the abstract. And you've got to pay that judgment before that house 
is cleared and can change hands. Now, here's what justification is. The sinner stands before God. God has the abstract, and I'll guarantee you, my abstract and your abstract has thousands of leaves and judgments against it in the form of sin against God. Now, that's got to be clear. That's what Jesus did. He went to an old rugged cross and paid and cleared every one of those liens and judgments against that abstract. I want to show you something in Romans. It's what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us, uh, give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that that justifies. That means clears the abstract. You see, all of the leaves were held by God himself. All of the judgments were by God the Father, but he accepted the death of his son on the cross as full payment for all of these liens and judgments that was against my account. And then Paul says, who has the audacity to stand from before the almighty God of heaven and earth and say, you're not when God says you are. It's God that justifies. It's God that, that renders the decision, the verdict, that all your liens and judgments have been canceled once and for all. And who can say that God is wrong? So the repenting candidate is brought to the judgment and there he is justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the sin death that he paid at Calvary, God says, clear title, justified. Boy, don't you ever tell somebody that they're not saved. Because if they are, I don't think God holds that very kindly. He said, justified. He says their abstract and title is clear. And who are we to say that it isn't? All the leaves have been taken off. All the judgments have been canceled. And it's free and clear. But God doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. You see, if God simply justified us, you know what that means? Praise God, I won't have to go to hell. But unfortunately, it doesn't mean I'll go to heaven either. It just means I've seen my eternity, float, my eternity floating around out there in space somewhere. I've just been set free. I don't belong to anything. I've got a, uh, I've got a clear title, but nobody wants to buy the property. See? I'm free and clear, but nobody wants the property. Oh, he didn't stop there. First of all, he clears the property. He cancels the sin debt. He makes the title clear. Then the work of the Holy Spirit is... The Holy Spirit gives you a new birth. He imparts to you the divine nature, Peter says. You become a child of God. So, the new nature, you must have the new nature. And you know, a lot of Christians really get confused on this. A lot of Christians really get confused concerning the new nature. What the new nature means this is that you have the nature of God. But I was reading something Spurgeon wrote. And he says, don't think for one moment. He says, you can have peace with God. But don't think for one moment you'll ever have peace with the flesh. He said, that will be a constant warfare from it now until you die. He said, the lion will lay down with the lamb. But he said, the spirit and the flesh will be a constant warfare. And you know what? A lot of Christians with a weak spirit, an overpowering flesh, they fall into sin and they think, and you, know, they, they, you know what? They look inward. They look inward. That's the worst place in the world to look. If you look for hope, don't look inward. 
Let me tell you something. Now, this is a true experience, and this happened to me for years. Satan was always pointing to me and say, look at you. Look what you did. Look what you thought. Look how you act. Look how cold you are towards the Savior. Look, 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 look. And every time he did that, all I could see is garbage. I mean, he was right. He was right. I mean, oh, man. He said, you, how, you try to tell anybody you're a child of God. Just look. Look down there. Look. Keep, you know, just stirring up the cesspool. Look, 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 look. He keeps pointing at me. You know what? He just kept pointing to the flesh. That's all he was doing. And you know what? I didn't have any peace. The day come, I said, whoa, wait a minute. I said, Satan, when you can find one thing wrong with Jesus, then you come back and talk to me about it, because he's my substitute. Yeah. Not me. I have to agree with Satan. I ain't no good. That's what Paul said. I'm the chief of sinners. He said, in me, that is in my first love, no good thing. I'm glad that I'm not saved because I'm good. I'm glad you're not saved because you're good, or we wouldn't have 104 here this morning. We wouldn't even be here by the time we locked the door this morning. Because none of us is good. We're saved because God does it. First, he judges us, not just We're quitting. Then he gives us the divine nature. And Paul said the same thing. He says the divine nature constantly wars against the flesh. He says, the things I would do, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't do, that I do. And he goes on and on and says, So then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Then he goes on to say, Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And that was called, it's like dragging a stinking corpse around all the time. How many here have made resolutions? Am I on what they're doing? <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, I promise this woman. Man, I'm going to be better tomorrow. I do. Josh, I don't want to leave my coffee cups in there, but I'm going to clean them up. I'll guarantee you the dishes will be done and the bed's made and whatever. <laughs> they don't always do that, see? I don't always do it because I'm just kidding. She's the house kid. She knows that. All of us, all of us desire, if you say, you always desire to be better. You want to be better. You always want to be better than what you are. But a lot of times you just don't quite make it, isn't it? How many times have you said, you know what? We're going to just start in church. Now, it's a bunch of bull. They're sleeping, sleeping 11 o'clock, and I'm not calling any names, but, but Jerry told me this morning. <laughs> I told his boy, I said, boy, it's a good thing you showed up. I told him, my wife done last night. I said, I'm going after that. And he told me this morning, he said, you know what? He said, boy, he said, we got up and we come this morning. I said, we want you to thank you. He said, that's the next thing we're working on. Well, the point is this. Huh? I'm going to have to hurt it. Well, the point is, the desire is there. See, but because of the weakness of the flesh. I went down there, wore blisters on my hands, working in the basement. Wayne said, I'll see you at 9 o'clock in the morning. He said, if I'm not there, start without me. And it's a good thing I did. He never did show up. Found out he slept till 11 o'clock. Now his heart, oh, he apologized. Oh, Jerry, I prayed for you. I laid there and I... <laughs> see, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, see. But God gives us the divine nature. Now, the next thing he does is adopt us. Now, isn't that strange? Now, now, we're born into the family of God, but he also adopts us. Why? Because that's a legal term. And what that carries is the condemnation that you have been taken out once from all from danger and placed in the family of God as a son. No longer can you ever be put back into jeopardy. In other words, the jeopardy or the danger of being lost. That's what adoption means. Do you know what? Under Jewish law, a Jew, a Jew told this. He said it's different than Gentile law. Under Jewish law, if you adopt a child, I don't care how they turn out, you can never cut them out of your will. Now, a natural born child, you can. 
But if you adopt him, you can never disinherit the dead. We've not only been born into the family, but God adopted us. Took us from danger to possession of danger or ever being lost, ever coming into condemnation, and has placed us as sons with all of the rights and the privileges of the sons of God. You know what? I'm thankful for something, Brother Harris. I don't have to wait on Sunday to go to the throne room. I'm a son. You know what? I can't call the prayers of them. I say I can't. I haven't tried. And I don't imagine I can't because I doubt he knows who I am and want to talk to him. You couldn't get through the lines visit. Your father's fifty sex treasures would get you before he ever would. But as a son, did you know what? The prince can walk up to the king any time he wants to and say, Daddy. Yeah. As sons of God, I'll be driving down the highway and say, Father. See, I have all the privileges of a son. Now, after he adopts you, the next thing he does, and if you would like to turn to Ephesians, I'm having to cut this a little short. I had a lot more that I wanted to say, but I'm having to cut it a little short because I'm running out of time, and I don't want to make two sermons out of it like I did last week and didn't finish the other half. In whom you, oh, Ephesians, the first chapter, 13th verse, I'll start reading there. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that holy spirit of promise. I see it. All right, now keep in mind, first of all, I come before the judgment bar of Christ, and he says all of your debts have been canceled. You're free as a boon. Then the Holy Spirit gives me the new birth, and then the Father adopts me into the family as a son, and then he seals me. All right, now, the seal, there's four aspects to the seal. Number one, the seal denotes ownership. You can look at the seal and you know who that property belongs to. That seal, that stamp. You are bought with a price and are not your own. Listen, God knows this. He says the foundation of God stand. If you still have in this seal, God knows those that belong to Him. He recognizes the seal. There's a lot of false prophets in there, but they don't have the seal. The seal denotes ownership. Uh, then it denotes authenticity. When you see the seal, you know it is authentic. When God looks down and sees the Holy Spirit in this man right here, he knows this man is your authentic, true, born-again son of God. He sees the seal. He is the seal. He's the Holy Spirit. Uh, then it denotes security. Listen, you don't break the seal. You don't break the seal. Daniel, you remember Daniel? You remember the king? They really loved Daniel, and they trapped Daniel, and, and they made they went to the king and said, "We want you to write a, a law, and that for thirty days no one can pray to any god other than you." And so he had all this drawn up, drawn up according to the Medes and the Persians. Now, the Medes and Persians had a contract, and when you draw it up, and it still goes on, it can't be altered. It can't be changed. And so the king did. He drew it up, stamped his seal on it, and they caught Daniel. And it said that the king, he, he spent the whole day trying to figure out some way to set Daniel free. Now, you say, well, he's the king. That doesn't matter. Once that seal goes on, that signifies security. Even the king can't break the seal. Daniel had to go into the lion's den. It denotes security, ownership, authenticity. But it also denotes a finished transaction. The last thing that goes on your justification, your new birth, your adoption is a finished transaction. Any legal document. They don't put the seal on there till everything is finished and every word is correct 
and the eye is dotted and every T is correct, then the official seal is stamped on those documents. You know what he's saying? Hey, it's finished. When Christ died on the cross, it is finished. You know what that means? God saves you. God justifies you. He gives you the new birth. He adopts you. He seals you. It's finished. It'd be an awful careless God that paid that much price for a pearl and just don't know where it is or don't keep up with it. If that's not enough, it says that it is hid in Christ. That pearl is hid in Christ to the extent that we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Boy, I can't think of a safer place to be than hid in Christ. He gives his angels charge over us. The angels are ministering spirit to the heirs of salvation. He said, my eye is continually on them, and my ear is open to their cry. God has a security system that won't fail. All right, now that's the judicial side. That's the legal side of it. Now this is the experiential side. This is when people come up and get saved and say, man, I feel poor. <laughs> this is why. I'm going to tell you why. Here's where the feeling comes in. Verse 14 of the first chapter of Ephesians. The Spirit is speaking to Spirit, which is the honest of our inheritance until... I'm going to stop right there. Which is the honest. How many know what the honest means? It's a pledge. It's a guarantee. I mean, if you ever bought a house, you, if you didn't have the cash, it's most of the thing. You have to put down what's called honest money. If you ever go to Kmart and put something in layaway, you don't just walk up and say, I want to put this dress in layaway. They make you put something down. I guess it. Isn't that right? They just put something down. That's earnest money. Now, what happens if you don't ever come back and get that dress? You lose your earnest money. Is that right? Now, after God has saved us, after he secured us, he says, so that you know that I have, I'm going to put down earnest money, and it's going to be the Holy Spirit himself. Now, if God doesn't keep you, did you watch the Holy Spirit with Paris? He lost his earnest. Does that make sense? You lose the earnest. And now, how long does this earnest stay with you? Until, until you backslide. Until you quit going to church, or until you don't come to Sunday school. It doesn't say that. Look how long it keeps you. You could keep this earnest, which is the earnest of our inheritance. That means that's just a part of the inheritance. The Holy Spirit is just a part of the inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Come to you, back right? Until the redemption of the purchase possession. Right after Christmas, I gave my wife some money for Christmas because she wanted clothes, and I wouldn't think about trying to pick out clothes for her. Y'all, I've told you that story, how I found a sequin blouse, bright green. I mean, it's beautiful. It looks like a whole bunch of flies, you know, in the full glory with the sun glistening off it. And I thought that was the prettiest thing, you know, and it was in a store, and I said, oh, honey, I said, I, I found something I've got to get for you. And I took over and showed her that it just covered the sequins, you know, greens, you decide, it just glim, just dazzles you, you know. She said, oh, I wouldn't have that thing. I said, you're kidding. I said, what's the matter with any woman that wouldn't love to have something like that? There was another woman standing over there. I said, well, I want to ask you a question. She said, what is it? I said, so I'm going to prove her wrong. I said, how do you like that brass? She said, I wouldn't wear that to a dog fight. <laughs> so I don't buy clothes for I give her the money. And I went with her. She was going to pick out some blouses and sweaters and stuff. And while I was there, I saw this jacket. But the sleeves were down here like this, you know. And she said, oh, I like that jacket. She said, you've got to buy that jacket. And I said, well, it's too long for me. She said, well, let's sit there and take it up. So I went and talked to the clerk. I said, I like this jacket and it fits me other than the sleeves. He said, can you take them out? He said, yes, we can. So I paid for the jacket. 
He gave me a ticket saying that I had paid for the jacket and another ticket which was a claim check. But I left the jacket. Why? They weren't through with it yet. I went back on Wednesday and said, I came to redeem my jacket. Now, God says, I give you believers the Holy Spirit until I come to pick you up. That's honest. Now, God knows he's going to do it. But this way now, we know he's going to do it because he's given us his Holy Spirit. Now, the reason people get saved is, boy, they start feeling good because when the Holy Spirit comes in, that earnest comes in. Boy, I mean, he starts ringing the joy bell. Doesn't he? Man, I feel good. I got saved. Man, I'm just walking on that. See, that's the earnest. That's God. And that is God that bearing witness with your spirit that what's gone on in glory is it justification, the new birth, adoption, and you've been sealed. I want to close with this story. Uh, I've told this to the text for, but maybe some of you have this, and, and I don't care, I'm going to tell it. I want to hear it again anyway. We're well, standing there, we'll watch a movie, you know, if you used to, she don't do it much anymore, I'll just clear that up. But you used to, we'd watch a movie, and the next day she'd tell us the movie word for word. You know, we said, Sandy, we, we saw the movie. She said, yeah, but I want to tell it anyway. Yeah. Well, that's the way I do. Some of you heard the story, but I want to tell it anyway. It's about a preacher by the name of Lester Roloff. A lot of you probably remember Lester Roloff. He said when he was a little kid, he lived on a farm. and He said on Saturday, they'd hook up their team and to a wagon, and they'd go to town, and they'd go to the general store, and they'd buy everything they needed for the week. Well, he said... Me and my older brother, he said, Mom and Dad get out at the general store, and he said, Well, now, boys, while we're in here buying the groceries and whatever we need, you go down to the ice house and get a 50-pound block of ice. He said, We'd turn the team around. He said, We'd go down to the ice house and we'd get a 50-pound block of ice. And we'd come back down there and pick up Mom and Dad and all the groceries and the piece goods and whatever they bought, boots and shoes and whatever they bought. He said, We went back home. He said, Then Mom would say, Well, boys, get out the ice cream tonight. So we'd get out the ice cream truck, said Mom would go out there and get some brown hen eggs out of the hen house, and she'd get some red cream and some sugar, and she'd make up that ice cream batter, and she'd pour it in that ice cream truck. So we'd chip up that ice, and we'd fill that thing full of ice, and we'd put salt on it, and he said, now you boys turn it. He said, now I was the littlest one, and he said, I'd turn it at first, and pretty soon it started getting hard to turn it. He said, Mama put a toe sack on it and said, Lester, you sit on the turn and let Big Brother turn it. So he'd sit on the turn and the Big Brother would turn it and pretty soon he'd get pretty stiff and she'd say, Well, now, wait a minute, boy. I think it's just about ready. He said, Mama would pour the salt water off and she'd take the toe sack off and she'd rake some of that salt water and ice away from it. She'd take that top off. And she'd pull the paddle out and put the top back covered up with toast and let it settle a little while, get a little harder. He said, Mama, give me and brother that ice cream pack. And he said, our tongues would be shimmy up and down that thing. He said, like monkeys on a flagpole. And he said, all that was was the earnest of things to come. <laughs> so we could lick that ice cream paddle and know there was a whole churn full of the same thing. You see, when God really blesses you, heaven's not going to be different. It's going to be a lot more of it. It's going to be same and kind. So, boy, when we get together and sing, when we all get to heaven and everybody's happy and we sing page 246 and everybody's shaking hands and hugging necks and everybody's blessed and we feel the spirit, that's just a little bit of heaven on earth. And the very fact that everybody's hugging one another and shaking hands is just proof positive that they have the earnest of the Spirit, and that the legal work has already been done in glory. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we're so thankful, Father, that salvation wasn't left there. We're so thankful, Father, that our, our only one and true God has worked out all the, the details and has done all the paperwork, and has worked out such a, a fantastic plan that there's no loophole, and that that seal suggests security and that we'll never fall, we'll never stumble. 
And Father, we're so thankful that by trusting in Jesus, we can have this chance that when the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there. Not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done. We thank you, Father, for the saving power and the keeping power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you for the honor that you've given us that does set those joy bells ring. Father, if there's any here this morning that don't know you as a Savior, we just pray this morning that they will come saying, yes, I repent of my sins, and yes, I trust Jesus as clearing my abstract. And I want for God to do all that is necessary for sure that I'll be there when the roll is called up God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.